Great. This is the blockchain. Uh, these dots are the data, and the lines in between are the chain. Um, the chain is the application logic. Um, it's what we use to define and to continually shape the data that's on the chain. Um, and this is layer two. Layer two is here, and it's here, and it's here. Layer two is what the blockchain is not. Um, it's everything else. And we're talking about layer two today. I'm talking about layer two today because, um, because of scaling um, on Ethereum and on Ethereum Classic. Um, and there's a couple of different kinds of scaling issues um, that we're thinking about on Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Um, the first one is this. Um, that green dot is a transaction. And so far, so good. Um, this is a loan, a rare transaction, and then it's processed through the chain. Um, no problems. Uh, this is when the problem happens. This is a throughput scaling issue. So when you get a lot of transactions, um, you get a congested chain and the availability for end users and developers, um, people who want to make transactions and use the chain, uh, goes down. Um, this is throughput and otherwise known as TPS transactions per second issue. This is the other kind of scaling issue. Um, as the chain grows, um, we're, we're building these, these stores of data replicated across an entire network. Um, and it's very bulky um, and it's annoying. Um, and that's the other kind of scaling issue that, uh, that's happening. But today, I'm talking about addressing um, the first issue, which is this throughput issue. Um, and one of the ways um, that we're talking about addressing this issue is off-chain. Um, and the reasons that we're talking about um, addressing this issue off of the chain um, in, in the layer two space as opposed to the layer one space is because it's accessible. Um, the layer two is accessible because you don't have to deal with um, the technical um, costs and the cat herding that's required for doing protocol level changes. Um, so we can act nimbly um, and we can um, hopefully improvise and we can find solutions that are diverse and as diverse as the applications that want to scale. Um, so here we have our potential transactions, potential or actual transactions, um, and instead of putting all of them on the chain, um, we only put a few of them on the chain and the rest of them um, we put somewhere else. Um, in, this time, in this case, the somewhere else is this enormous amorphous blob um, that's notably empty right now. Um, and so there's options for how, what we're going to fill with this, um, what we're going to fill in this blob and how we're going to handle these transactions that we're assuming aren't going to be made on the chain anymore. Uh, one of the options is to use a blockchain, of course, um, because this is San Francisco Blockchain Week. I think it should come as no surprise that that's option number one. Um, and the other is use something else. Um, this is a stand-in for a, just a different kind of application. Um, now. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of shaping the blockchain, um, the iterated blockchain, as a pattern for scaling. Um, and there's so many that it's not even worth trying to list. Um, but there are a couple of important ones and notably famous ones. Um, and the first one that I want to talk about is Plasma. Um, Plasma is, um, in the Ethereum world, um, one of the forerunner ideas and protocols around using uh, a sidechain scaling approach. Um, Plasma is a protocol. And it would look something like that. Um, and you can see um, that I've used little squiggles in between. That's the chain logic. That's the application logic. And instead of being a straight chain, um, like the main network is using um, improvised chain logic. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. But in this case, the blocks are still relatively very much the same shape. Um, and the way Plasma works um, is that you have a seed contract on mainnet. You're going to generate tokens in that seed contract. Um, and then you're going to move those tokens um, over to a plasma chain, um, and those tokens will be commoditized, and then eventually they'll be shuffled back to the main net for processing. Um, this is the other kind. Um, uh, this is another big idea um, in, in, the, in the layer two space. Um, and this is state channels. This is my, my drawing for state channels. 
Um, these little green dots are transactions. They're green. Um, they look a little different than they do on the mainnet because you can improvise a little bit with these transactions. Um, but the idea is that you're taking transactions that do would have meaning on the main chain, but you're sending them around off chain and then eventually porting them back to the chain where they're unfurled in some way. Um, and, uh, and of course, you don't have to do these separately. These are not mutually exclusive ideas. Um, you can have one with the other um, just as well. Um, and so it's, it's time now to ask, why are we talking about using iterated blockchains as a way to solve the blockchain scaling problem? Um, and I think there's a couple of good reasons for it. Um, one of the first reasons is that it's efficient and effective to carry a stack through. Um, so you get to reuse developers who have a very niche expertise. You get to reuse APIs. You get to reuse the tools and clients that you already have. Um, and in that way, it's, um, it's just an efficient way to build a software stack. Um, and, that there, and because there's a lot of things that we can do on our improvised side chain, like a plasma chain that's using alternative consensus mechanisms, um, we can solve quite a few problems around scaling in that way. Um, another answer um, is that we want to use some characteristic or characteristics of the blockchain um, off of the chain. So maybe we want auditability and transparency. Um, maybe we care about verifiability. Maybe we care about atomic changes. Um, those are all great reasons for using a blockchain because that's how the blockchain is designed to work. Um, and those are characteristics that we get when we use this application and data structure. Um, and, and one of the things that's worth noting is that we're taking some of these features from the blockchain that we like. Um, and we're also going to be leaving some features behind. Um, most notably, those features that we're leaving behind are going to be the quote unquote consensus features um, of Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. These are the features that provide the security and stability um, and that are the economics that drive the value in these chains. But we're going we're to forego those um, because those are very slow. Um, they're very secure, but they're very slow. Um, so we're going to leave those behind. We're going to use a proof of authority consensus mechanism, and we're going to fudge a little bit. And we're going to say, you know, we kind of trust each other, and there's a reason that we want to have decentralized data, and we want to carry this stack through. So this is an option that makes sense for us. Um, and so with that, I want to um, annotate um, some trust architectures here. Um, this star means trust. <laughs> I've got a whole visual system going here, and this star means trust. Um, and one of the first things I want to point to is that um, on the reference chain, um, otherwise the mainnet, whether that's the Ethereum or Ethereum Classic networks in this case, um, we have a contract. And when we're using a contract as an anchoring point for these um, layer two solutions, we're beginning with a centralized system. So. Um, so a plasma definition that begins with, we have a contract, we create tokens, and those tokens will be commoditized. That plasma system, whatever happens from there, is going to be bound um, by that first assumption that there is one contract on mainnet. Um, and as we're moving into a blockchain space in layer two, an improvised blockchain space, we need to keep in mind that this trust that we're going to place in our application that's going to be as trusted as it is, as we expect it to be used, we're going to be having that trust locked up in one contract. Um, and um, and that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind, in particular in this space and with these chains. Um, and also keeping in mind that this consensus responsibility that's existing now in one contract is when we think about blockchains and we think about um, their connotations and their executions. This is a consensus responsibility that is just typically distributed um, in these systems. Typically in Ethereum, well, actually in Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, this consensus responsibility is generated as a function of the participation of all of these nodes. Every node has a share um, in building this consensus that we trust, uh, whereas in this schema, one contract um, has that same responsibility. Um, the second responsibility um, and trust mechanism um, is, the, uh, is the consensus, is our application layer logic that we're going to use um, on our side chain. Um, 
So we're doing this because we're using a different uh, consensus mechanism because we want it to be more performant, more flexible, more customized um, than the main chain. Uh, but of course, how much you trust this mechanism um, relies on how much you trust the people running this chain. This is a business relationship. Um, and finally, um, it's important to note that it's critical in this space um, in, in practical use that the developers and operators who are going to be working with these side chains want to be intertwined as much as they can with the mainnet. Um, and so here's a short point, is because you need a way to get from the mainnet to the side net. Um, and so this is a tricky, this is a tricky thing. Um, a characteristic that both plasma and state channels share um, is this idea of a window that exists that's in the contract on the main net. Um, and this is a window that has a couple of names um, and one job. And um, names and, and reasons that it exists are for counterfactual reasons. Um, there are contradictory, fraud-proof, um, fraud-proof windows, contestation windows. Um, and in these windows, um, the anchoring contract has a time frame, and it says, give me your reports about what happened on the side net, and, and then I'm going to wait. I have a window where I will hear your cases, and if I hear contradicting cases, then I will theoretically have the logic to know how to resolve those cases. But if I don't hear those cases, then um, I can only make a decision on what I hear about. Um, and in programming, there is a very notorious, uh, very uh, smelly kind of bug called the race condition. Um, and this is one of those. These windows are race conditions. Um, a race condition is where, um, as you can see here, I'm not going to read it for you, but that's what Wikipedia has to say about a race condition. Um, and they're very tricky things. Um, and one of the um, implications of this race condition and these windows um, is that when and if um, the chain becomes unavailable for whatever reason, if it becomes congested or if there's a malicious attack, um, and it can become then impossible for the honest or good actor um, to report um, the truth, the true truth, uh, to the contract within this window, um, then, uh, the, the, then a good result will not happen. Um, and noticing that these dots here um, is exactly where we started. Um, and that's, um, and th that's one of the, the catch-22s of this, is that we started off with this data availability, with this scaling issue, and we have a solution that, um, that that's exactly the weakness. Um, and so the next, the, the next part of the conversation when we're talking about sidechains, because this is, not, this is a known issue with, with sidechains and plasma, um, is this data availability issue. So the next idea is, OK, um, we'll build a market. In order to fix this mechanism, that's how we're connecting these two chains, we'll build a market. We'll use game theory and economics. Um, and, and by having bounties and rewards, bounty hunters, fee structures, um, dynamically scaling windows for justice and retribution, um, that we, we'll have a, a usable level of surety that, um, that, the, good, that the good result will come. Um, but, but it's really important to, to recognize and keep in mind that this is a market. Um, and we're going to be trusting a market um, with, with our data, with, with our data as much as we're trusting the side chain with our data. Um, and we're trusting it with a utilizable security guarantee. Um, and we're trusting that the market is going to, expect, is going to behave in consistent and expected ways. Um, and for markets that have to do with humans, which is all of them, that is not always the case. So sufficiently final and secure to be very useful. I thought this was a great, um, a, a poignant and um, excellent criteria for, um, for what, what we're hoping for from a layer two solution. Um, and so that's why I want to talk about architectures of trust so that we can think clearly about this tabula rasa, this, this gigantic um, empty circle. Um, so client, um, that's a contract. This is, um, this is star number one. We have a way of bridging off of the chain. This is star number two. Um, this can either be as concrete and as simple as something like a Unix socket um, or an HTTP request. Um, 
This would be connecting theoretically, um, let's say, a, a validating, validating node um, on the side chain and um, a trusted client on the main chain. Um, another way of doing it is this. Um, it's the Wild West. Um, it's a market, and I'm not saying that the market won't work. Um, you know, I'm just saying that, uh, that it's, it's a different approach, and it has different assumptions, um, and we can expect that we'll have different behaviors. Um, and secondly, or thirdly, um, <laughs> thirdly, we have um, our layer two application, which in this case has been a blockchain of some variety. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are good reasons for using a blockchain. Um, but I want to stress now I've changed the shape of these dots, changed the shape of the blocks on purpose, um, because it is arbitrary, the logic that we're using to handle this data. Um, we can use anything. Uh, and if we don't care so much about accommodating um, some fuzzy flavor of decentralization, um, we can use um, the applications that make up the most of the internet today. Um, if, we want central, if we want decentralization, but we don't care for the shape of the blocks, um, we can use other mechanisms to handle a distributed data store. Um, and and they, they exist, they abound. There are ways of doing this that are not blockchain, and that's okay. Um, there is space for more than one solution. That's one of the beauties of working off of the layer one. Um, and of course, you don't just have to work with one chain. Um, More transactions. This is the general idea. Um, you're expecting to handle the majority of the transactions on your layer two application and then shuffle them off to one or more chains uh, for processing, one or more applications for processing, I should say. Um, so that's the spiel on, that's my spiel on the architectures of trust in layer two. Now, I want to talk about what we're doing at ETC Labs because. Um, Interoperability is an attitude and an opinion that brings us together as a team. It motivates us, um, it unifies us, and I think it's a characteristic um, that permeates the tools and applications that we're working on every day. Um, and, and, and what's coming of this is that we're able to live very, very happily in this space right now um, with some of these tools that we have. So. Um, I work on Multigeth, that's, that's, that's my baby. Um, and Multigeth is really exciting um, because it's a, it's a downstream client of GoEthereum um, that has introduced some refactorings to remove um, some opinions that are introduced upstream. Um, and in doing so, it makes the client accessible um, to a wide variety and to a lot of species of EVM-based networks. Um, and the Ethereum JSON RPC specification and Jade Service Runner. I got a GIF here. This is a Jade Service Runner UI running on a Mac. Um, and uh, let's see here. Um, the Ethereum JSON RPC spec is exciting because it's building a standard and unified specification for EVM-based um, and beyond that, but in this case, EVM-based um, EVM clients to provide a way to discover and serve and interact with these APIs that they do have in common. Um, and the Jade Service Runner is a tool that's built on top of this specification. Um, so I'll go back. What you can see here in this GIF is that I've got installed, this in my menu bar, and what's going on here is that I'm installing, downloading, installing Multigeth, and then I'm automatically presented with um, seven different chains that I can turn on literally with the click of a button, turn back off, and explore then. By clicking on, I can see the APIs that they expose, I can see this data, I can interact with this data, hitting these endpoints with real data in real time and getting a result from the clients that are running on my machine. Um, and Jade Service Runner is providing endpoints that look like this. Um, so this is predictable, this is programmatic, and it's extensible. From each of these endpoints that were just listed, um, we can dive in. This is another one of the tools that we've built um, around OpenRPC. This is the playground. So you can see that I've actually put in a, a raw URL up here on my local machine. And this is bringing in the service that's provided. This is the service discovery mechanism. Um, and I can interact with the API, um, not just as documentation, but as an actual living thing, um, which is great for not only documentation correctness, but developer experience. Um, so, 
Uh, leading up to this last week, I thought it would be really cool to try to pull this together in a demo. Um, and I've got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to really try to breeze through this. Um, but what you can see in this probably too small um, and too slow motion GIF um, is what I pulled together this weekend um, to demonstrate an interacting um, application that's existing between Gurley and Cadi. That's Ethereum's foundations, Gurley test network, and Ethereum Classic's um, Cadi test network. Um, Different networks run by different people uh, with different transactions on them. And I'm not telling you that I built this in a weekend because I'm a great programmer. I'm not. I wrote this in Node and TypeScript, and I don't program in those, so I'm definitely not at the top of the heap when it comes to writing this stuff. So the, the point is that I can do this with this much code. Um, it, this is how accessible it is to me to be able to do this. You can see that I have functions that are four lines long that say set up clients. I can configure my Cadi and Gurley nodes um, with five lines, and I can hook them up just like this. And this, um, this application I ran overnight, and I was able to trade 3,500 transactions back and forth between the networks. Um, and this is because we have the tools that we can leverage to do this. This is not a special application. Um, this is Jade Explorer. This is another one of the tools that we've built. Um, this is like the, the a lot sexier older cousin of my Stargate um, application. Um, this is an Explorer that's running off of Service Runner, running off of OpenRPC, um, that is happily living in the space between these chains right now. And on top of all this, and one of the pillars um, that's really supporting all of this is the OpenRPC specification standards that we've been working on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> without, without the OpenRPC specifications, um, documentation is hard, service discovery is hard, and OpenRPC is making those easy. Um, and JSON RPC being easy is a really big deal in the blockchain space because every single client in the blockchain space that I'm aware of uses JSON RPC as the way to get at their APIs. Um, and this is just a shout out beyond the team. Um, this screenshot actually was not built by us. This was built by somebody else. Um, and I found this on Discord and they built this on top of OpenRPC. And this was a developer working with Ubic and they were able to build this incredible, very beautiful Explorer and application for their API because they're plugging and playing with OpenRPC. Uh, I'm Isaac, I work with ETC Labs Core and that's it. <laughs>